facing in this day and age in which we're living in this world, the mess that it's in, the homes, the things that we've seen. And the enemy is trying to rob, kill, and destroy everything and everybody that he can. And so and if we're not on guard, he will have the upper hand. And so therefore, we as a church body need to pray continually. So last week, we looked at Jesus, at Jesus believed prayer works. And this is one of the things that we studied last week. And then we finished up knowing that the essentials of prayer are who we are, who are we praying to. We talked about that last week. We talked about God's word is true last week. God can do what he says he can do. I am who he says I am. And when I can believe these essential things, then my prayer life will become more effective. But if I don't believe God's word is true, I'm just praying empty words. Because if I can't believe that God says he heals, he'll supply our needs, He'll meet all of our needs, all that. If I can't believe those things that's in God's word, then my pr prayers are really kind of fruitless. And so, therefore, we have to understand these are essential things. And then the more we have, the more of the relationship we build with him, the more he, these essential things will become part of our life and we'll be able to pray more effectively. I know most of us have been church all, all of our life and we, we pray and we understand praying, but it was not until I really begin to desire to pray differently that the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and I understood a little bit more about praying. However, each time I teach the study, each time I talk about prayer, and it just encourages me in, to grow deeper and to understand more. But we started uh, last week again like praying like Jesus. So we're going to continue that a little bit more this week on there. The thing about it is praying like Jesus. And, and I, when I'm studying this, I just cannot get over how many examples and how many things there is in prayer, how Jesus prayed. And I think if Jesus had to pray that much, how much more do I need to pray? Um, but again, he had prayer, and he, and as just as Jesus needs prayer time, then we need prayer, and we need time to seek him along. The first part is, and I'm going to do most of my scripture tonight from the New King James Version. That's where most of, most of it's coming from tonight. Um, but the, in the first part of this, it talks about Jesus prayed alone. Now, and in Luke 9 and 18, it says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? And so this is this is, gives us a clue right here that he prays and prayed in private. I know we come to church and we pray, but each of us needs to have our own private prayer time. Because if we don't, what happens is, I don't know if you, if you ever uh, stood by somebody, um, a lot of times I'll be praying, but I'll be listening to what everybody else is praying around about me if I'm not careful. My mind will get over there on what they're saying rather than what I'm saying or what the, who the person's praying is saying. But there are times that I have to have a long time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as he did, he got along with his father. So are we. We need to get along and seek the Father's face. And he said, Luke 19, he says, Jesus was praying in private. And in Mark 14 and 23, and it says, After he had dismissed him, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And then Luke 12, I think, uh, 6, 12, refers to the same one. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out into the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying with, to God. Has anybody ever been to an all-night prayer meeting? Mm -hmm. Is, was it hard to do? It's when you get first get started, it's hard to pray and hard to focus. But I wonder... If sometimes the church went back to some all-night prayer meetings to where we came and just prayed and sought the Lord, how many miracles, how many things would we see change? Because like I said last week, we come to church and we pray. Randall prays, he does a great job. We pray when we're praying in the altar and things like that. But we have to have more than that. We have to have our own individual time and there's nothing wrong with praying in community. We're going to look at that a little bit more. But just the long time is so important. And I can remember as a child going to all-night prayer meetings. I can remember that. But I didn't really understand as a child. Half the time we slept, you know, when I was young and stuff. But as we got, as I got older and attended some prayer meetings, um, I know uh, it really builds your strength and it builds your faith on here. Uh, Houston and I attended a church where we had 21 days of prayer. And we went every night for 21 days. And we fasted those 21 days as well. But I will tell you, it really produced spiritual growth in us. It did. It helped us to understand even more 
Um, and, you know, and that's not everybody's called to do that. You have to do it when you're called to do it in the way that you're called to do. But, however, I will say that the church age, I say, when I say the church, I'm not necessarily just talking about this church. I'm talking about the church in general. We have lost the art, and I call it an art, of fasting and praying. The whole overall church, we've lost the art. We have programs. We have classes. We have this and that. But we have lost the art of fasting and praying. Why? Because that's self-discipline, and it's very hard for us. We don't like it. It's easier to come to a Bible study than it is to fast and pray, right? Mm -hmm. It is, isn't it? It's much easier. It's much easier to come to a Bible study, and we should do those things as well. But when we say, okay, we're going to have a prayer, prayer. You think so? Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I'm sure probably some of those older ones know we came to church on Sunday night. We came an hour early, and the ladies went to a prayer room. Went to the prayer room. And we prayed before the church ever started. And then, you know, regular church. That's how I grew up, was like that on there. Now, this day and age, and I'm not saying this in a funny way, but yes, kind of in a funny way. Most of us need an altar out there before we ever get in here so that we can get ourselves ready to come in here to worship together. I, maybe I can release all my things. I, I pray, I want to call it pray throughout there before I get into here. And therefore, as we come together, the power of God will be more relevant to us. But again, each of our own part, we have to deal, we have to figure this out for ourselves, what's best for us. Some people like to pray early in the morning, some people like to pray in the evening. I'm a person. I like to get up and pray with the Lord early. But this is the thing, the main, the main thing is, is that we do sometimes, during the day, find some alone time with the Lord and pray. Why? Why is it so important? The reason it's so important is that the solitude with God is crucial to our relationship to him. Now, let's talk about this. If I only talk to Houston on Sunday, what kind of relationship would we have? A weekend affair. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Think about it. If the only time you ever talk to your spouse or you talk to your friend or whatever, it was only one. But I wonder how many Christians only talk to God one time a week. It is so important that we understand that the solitude with God is, so, is, 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 well, is what's crucial to our relationship with Him. So why is it important? One of the first things is, as we are in solitude and prayer with God, it exposes us to God's wisdom. God is all-wise and all-knowing. Spend time with Him, alone with Him, and remain ignorant of who God is. Acts 4.13 says, And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these had been with Jesus. So when you are with God, spending time with God, he will give you his wisdom. He'll give you your direct, his direction. He will help us balance our life. He will help us to know how to respond to certain situations, how, when to pray, when not to pray for somebody, when to do this. If we will allow his wisdom to take part of us, but again, is spending time with him. I do not know who God is and what he's about unless I spend time with him. I can't know what he expects from me and wants from me. And spending time with me, with me in prayer and in his word, those are the two things that on there. Um, but again, like it said, when those, it said that when they saw Peter and John, they realized that these people had been with Jesus. I wonder when does the world realize we've been with Jesus? Is there anything they see in us that's maybe where we work? That those people have been with Jesus on oh, there. And that's why I think, again, the church has lost its influence because we have not spent our time with prayer the way that we should, prayer and fasting. It is we receive divine perspective. And God's perspective allows us to rise above the daily grind of life and realize he is sovereign. I think of anything that we are missing in the church is a divine perspective. We have a worldview perspective. 
But a lot of times we miss the divine perspective. What is God's idea? What's God's plan? Ideas on here. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 through 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And he says, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts in your heart, than your thoughts. As his ways are higher than our thoughts, his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. We need his divine perspective. We come to church and see people and know what we might know they're hurting. We might know that. But God's divine perspective is what? Okay, what is your life? What perspective does he have for you? What, what is it? And knowing what he has for me, being intimate. I can't know those things. I don't know what God's speaking to you about. You don't know what God's speaking to me about. You don't know what level God is moving us on. But he has each of us. But he speaks up because my thoughts and my way. So we have a divine perspective of God. I do think the Holy Spirit can tell us, hey, this person might need prayer. I pray for this person. Once the Holy Spirit can prompt us to pray for someone. And he might even give us an idea of what we're praying for. Sometimes God just gives me a word, but I don't know what it means sometimes. I mean, I don't know. Um, but this is the thing again, knowing that divine perspective. My desire is to know God so deeply, to know how the Holy Spirit works in me. My life is so that when the world, I mean, like here, they saw him and said, hey, we know they've been with Jesus. I want the world, I want when I go to Walmart for people to say, have been with Jesus. I want us to, I want to have that divine perspective in me to understand that his thoughts, but what, what is his desire? What is God's desire for the world? He died for mankind. He wants all men to be born again. That's his desire. And like I said, we get so busy and so bombarded with things that we forget that this is what we as Christians should be about, what he has on them. Any thought on that? The third part is the renewal of physical and spiritual strength. When we spend time in we gain spiritual strength and enjoy spiritual refuel. Refuel, fueling. Can you talk about it? I will tell you, I don't think I've ever seen a generation or a church so, I want to say, tired and lacking spiritual strength. We seem to just, oh, if I could just get by today. If I could just get by today, I'm so tired, I'm so weary on here. But we need to be renewed in his strength, renewed in the Holy Spirit, so that the joy of the Lord is our strength. I mean, we just see Christians who are miserable. And if I don't have any joy of the Lord, I don't have any strength. In Isaiah 40 and 31, it says, What? But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I think that's the key right here. Wait for the Lord and wait on the Lord. And he said, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be how we need spiritual giants in this world in which we're living. We need the church to rise up. We need to mount up with wings as eagles. We need not to be weary. We need to walk and not faint in this society. This needs to see something different. And when you go out in the world, basically, and I'm talking about the church in the whole, anything different than what they're living. So why do they want what we have if we don't have anything different? If we don't have the joy of the Lord, if we if we're not helping, the Lord helping us with our battles, if we're if we're just sitting around under I want to call it all the time, joy with no strength, we're not showing the world anything. But the reason we're under this is because we are not letting the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, through time and prayer, refuel us. The world. And if you listen to the news all the time, we drag them down here. Worst thing you've ever seen. You will think this world, you know, coming to an end. Was it Chicken Little? The sky's falling. And we have a lot of Chicken Little Christians. A lot of doom and gloom. And let me just say this. I know this is a little bit stepping on toes, but if you spend more time and we are the church 
comes out of your community. We as a church, and again, I'm talking about all of us as church, we need to rise. We need to become mighty warriors full of the power of God during this time. We need to be so full of God that when we see somebody on the side of the street that the Lord says stop and witness too, we need to be able to stop being right then and pray for those people and those people. But we're so busy, so encumbered with the things of the world, and we're so burdened down with the things of the world and the cares of the world that we don't have energy to even give out to anybody else. And so to be renewed. And the way to do it is that we spend time in the Lord. Just wait on the Lord. I dare say that most of the Christmas prayers, Lord, I need this, I need this, and thank you, Lord, amen. Up we go. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for our needs. Absolutely nothing wrong. But have you ever just sat before the Lord and just said, Lord, I love you. Lord, I worship you. Lord, I honor you. I did. According to that song I talked about last week, I didn't come here to ask you for anything. I just came to talk to you, Lord. Do we ever just go to the Lord just to talk to the Lord? And I think we have to ask ourselves those things. We all can get busy with life. I know I live life. I work a full-time job. I keep a house. I run granddaughters. I do this and that. Everybody else does. But there has to be a time that I pull myself aside. So the Holy Spirit dwell in me who can give me wisdom, give me direction, who give me strength to refuel me. This world can tear you down. But my those who wait on the Lord, what will happen? He'll renew their strength. And he shall they shall mount up with wings like eagles. His eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We should mount up with wings like eagles. What does an eagle do? It soars, doesn't it? Get weary. The Christian church seems to be battered and broken down. They don't seem to be soaring. Lord, let us soar. Let us soar like we never have before. In Psalm 63, verse uh, 68, five, O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to who? To his people. It is God. So if I'm struggling and I need strength and I need power, I need to spend time because he's the one who's going to give me that. He's the one who's going to help me get through these things. He's the one to help me be more vigorous about, you know, how I feel in the church and things like that. Even your health. He'll give you, renew your strength. That's what he said. He'll give strength. But I do believe it means both physical and spiritual strength. He'll renew. He'll renew us. On them. Next thing we need to understand is that He gives us daily guidance. God promises us all the way through our lives. Psalms 48, verse 114. Forever. He will be our God even to death. He will be our God. He will guide us wherever we need to go. Whatever path we have to go down, He will be our God. He's our God. He's not going to lead us off some path somewhere will lead us in the path he has us go. So how do we receive his God? Any thoughts? The Holy Spirit. Psalm 48, 9 says, That's, we have thought, O oh God, or we meditate, O oh God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. That is how we get guidance. We meditate on the Lord. He will give us our strength. He will give us his, his thoughts. Help us. To understand, we need guidance in this world in which we live in now more than ever. I mean, when you like you look at the election year, you look at this saying this and that one saying this one. Even in the local leader, his guidance, we need his discernment on what to do. We really do, and if we've ever needed it, we need it now because in the last days, what does it say? Careless times will come. It also says people will be deceived. Why? For lack of knowledge. So if I don't know what God's word says, if I don't, if I'm not Him giving me guidance, then I'm going to be in a mess. I'll be deceived, and that's what He said. So let's pray that we will let God guide us. And then the other thing with God and solitude is we experience conviction and correction. Psalm 17, verse four and five. It says, "Concerning the works of men, by the works of your lips 
I've kept away from the paths of the destroyer. I've told my steps in your path that my foot. This is one of the reasons that we can know that the Bible, the Bible is a book that I've ever read that convicts and corrects. Now, I can read a novel. It might make me feel good. I might enjoy it. But it doesn't convict me and correct me like the Word of God does. And so this, again, this is part of it. We, the reason we need to be alone with the Lord Jesus Christ is because in time we're here, it's because he convicts us and corrects us. Do we need conviction? We all do. We live, you know. Again, I've talked about this over and over and over. My spirit man got saved. My mind will and most saved, and they have to get convicted a lot. Anybody else have that problem or just me? <laughs> Worry, fear, anger, aggravation. We can get there, can't we, real easy on this. But again, it is his word and it's prayer and time with him that he will convict us and give us correction. And aren't we glad he's a loving father? That he don't come down and beat us on the head. He'll just say, you know, you'll spend time with me. We'll talk about this. We'll talk this way. I'll help you. And if you mess up again, guess what? We he still loves us. He still forgives. He still helps us. But again, it's that spending that time with him. And the flex of this is God's great reward. God rewards time spent alone in him with prayer. You pray. You should not be a hypocrite, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the street that they may be seen. I say to you, they have your, their reward. But you, when you pray, go to a room, and when you have shut your door, pray to her father who is in the secret place, and your father sees in secret will reward you openly. He rewards. He rewards us. How does he reward us? From God. It makes Marcia sweet feet not sweet. It makes flower. Those to me are God's rewards. And not only that, he supplies our needs. He gives us health. He gives us he gives us children that we like to kill sometimes, you know, but, you know, <laughs> especially for those of you who have teenagers. <laughs> but understand, those are the rewards. And if you will pray in secret, you know, in the secret place, him we reward us openly. He supplies our needs. He gives us peace, joy. Supplies our strength. Yeah, you know, some days we just need strength. Like again, you know, I'll share with you all. I can remember I was going through what I was doing for my first husband. And I can remember there were some days I didn't say, God, if you do not help me get through this day, I will not make it. I will not make it. And he would give me enough strength to get up and go another day on there. That's what he'll do for us. Sometimes I might just need emotional strength, physical strength. I might just need not. Like a, for lack of a better term, he will give me for us to get up. He will help us on there. Any thoughts about that? Any, to me, that's exciting to know that he and he will. The great I am. Everything we have need of, and why we don't want to go out and pray to understand. Because we just let the cares of the world choke it out, I think. Even with me, I get busy. And there's times when I go back to God and realize where I need to be. The presence of the Lord is so real. And when he sees me change day to day, the things that might bother me a month ago when I spend time with the Lord don't bother me. And I will tell you, he wants to fill us with fear, wants to fill us with worry and anxiety. Society with something like anxiety medicine on my born days. But the Bible says what? Be anxious. But says. So therefore, this is what he gives us. So so it's really important again that we spend time along with the Lord. I love coming to church. I love Randall praying. I love hearing people pray. But I have to have that.
that one-on-one -on -one time with God. I needed to keep myself in order. And, I, you know, I will just pray magic over me and that would be it. But it doesn't work like that. I have to spend that alone time with the Lord. Amen. And then the next part of this is Jesus prayed in community. He not only prayed alone, but he also prayed with others. Luke 9, 28 says, Now it came to pass about eight days after things that he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And one thing I think we have to remember is that our relationship with God is personal, but it's not private. We come together here as a community. What happens when we come together? We can come together in one mind, one accord. There's power in a group of people praying together. So it's important not only do we have this, that we just have the song, the alone time prayer, but that we come to church and have community prayer as well. It's really important that we do that. Again, our per personal relationship with God is personal, but it's not private. Jesus balanced his personal relationship with his Father and with the others. He encourages us to get along and pray, and he also wants us to pray with others. Praying with others, other people of God, is foundational to our worship here at church. I think praying together. We cannot come together as a body and pray and have community here. Can you imagine what it would be if we didn't? Everybody just be here doing their own thing. Just acting however they wanted to act. But this is foundation to our worship. Matthew 18 and 20, it says, My name what? I will be in the midst. Does it say, when we are together, I'll be in the midst? Do I know that when you can be alone and the Holy Spirit can visit with you? Yes, and you can get in God's presence. But if you are together in my name, I will be in the midst of them. You know why I think he says that? Because me and Marcia and Stephanie go out on a and Stephanie might have had a bad day and I had a good day. But when the Holy Spirit comes among us, we can be all in the same I can help Stephanie, she can help me, just help, help Marcia. Because, he says, for two or three are together, I'll be with you. And sometimes there is just, there is very much, when people come together, it encourages, there is encouragement. I can be with Marcia and say, Stephanie, say, hey, this is what's going on in my life. Or you all can say, this is what's going on. And, and there's that encouragement. So there's a community that we have to have, and we need that. Does that mean I just go out there and, and bear everything? No, not necessarily. The Holy Spirit will let you know who to bear stuff to. And if someone bears stuff to you, keep your mouth shut. Because we need community, but we don't need anybody to be betrayed. We need community. And I don't know if any of y'all have been to a church. I have. And so therefore... Having a community does not mean we tell everything that we know. You love a person. We love our body of Christ here. We love one another, and we pray for one another. And we bear one another's burdens. And if I'm bearing your burden, I'm talking about your burdens to everybody. I'm carrying it myself only. And we all have things. We all have times in our lives that we struggle, and we go through things. We all do. On there. But again, we need community. Um, Praying with other people, like I said, is foundational to our worship. Community worship is a vital part of our worship, and we can't worship God. We can't worship without praying. That's part of worship. That's part of coming here to worship on Sunday morning. It's praying, praising worship, hearing the word. All of that is part of our community praying. And this is what really kind of stood out for me. I had never thought about this. It's not that it's not an accident that the Lord's Prayer begins with. Our Father. And that's community. Otherwise, it might have said my Father. Because he is each of our fathers. Community, he's our Father. We say the same Lord. He is our Father. So as community, when we come together to pray, it's our Father. And if he's my Father, then you're my brother and you're my sister. Because he's our father. And as community come together to love our brothers and sisters. And that's what church is really about. It's coming together, having harmony, having community, loving our brothers and sisters, and worshiping together. It's because we have what? Our father. 
our name. So we're going to move on to the next part of Jesus. And this thing is like a simple part of Jesus' life. Did Jesus say the blessing before his meal? We do. I grew up saying the blessing. I never really know that Jesus blessed me. Never really thought about it. Did y'all? He prayed. Now, he might have been praying on blessing. Like, but he prayed over the food. And, and I, all my life, I grew up saying the blessing. My parents never just said, we say the blessing because Jesus said the blessing. No. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. He says, why do we say the blessing? Jesus prayed before Mark 6, 41. He says, and when he'd taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and broke the loaves. Set them there, and the two fish he divided among them all. Yes. I, listen, I think probably my dad and my mother prayed over five kids when they were feeding five kids. <laughs> because <laughs> five teenagers, it's a lot. But he says, and when he's taking, and so about that as Jesus saying the blessing. I just grew up saying the blessing, didn't really know why I said the blessing. I was a Lord for the food. That was all I knew. Originally, I think it came from Jesus praying over the food. Where the blessing over the food started from it was back when Jesus prayed over the food. And everything gives thanks. Mark 14, 22, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to them, and said, take, eat, and this is my body. Again, you see Jesus' blessing. On the, and of course, that could be a different context, but at the same time, he took, they were eating, and he broke the bread. But praying before meals is Thing. Why is it a good thing? It reminds us of God's blessings, like you said. It reminds us of the blessing of God. It helps us to realize that God has blessed us with the, with the ability to eat. There are some people who don't have the ability to eat. And then we have the resources to eat. There are people who don't have enough food. There are, there are people in the United States, I think, who do not have enough food. So we need to be thankful. So not... and. You know, we grew up saying the same blessing forever and ever and ever. We just have a memorized blessing. But if we stop and really think about saying the blessing, it helps us to realize, Lord, I really thank you for this food. I could live somewhere where we don't have food. We could have a drought and not have food. I could be sick and not be able to eat. Is Bob you have, that your plant has a feeding tube? He's not able to eat. If I get on a tube, I want chocolate. <laughs> Rosie, too. <laughs> Be me, Jeff. But, I mean, chocolate's a blessing. I mean, maybe that sounds simple, but I think God is just that simple. I think God loves me that much. God gives me chocolate. But, you, but I think sometimes we want to make it be something that's really big when it can be just a chocolate bar. But it's being thankful and blessing on you. It helps, again, helps us to realize how blessed we are with the ability to eat and the resources that we have to eat. And the next part of this is that Jesus Jesus offered thanks. 11.25 At the time Jesus answered, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden this from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to your babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good. Again, Jesus offers thanks. I thank you, Father, that heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things now. There are certain things there that we I don't understand exactly what he's talking about. There's secret things, there's things, but God has revealed to each of us. And aren't we thankful? First of all, he revealed that real to us, the Holy Spirit revealed to us that we're in need of a Savior. That's the first thing. How else would we know we need a Savior? on here. So we should be thankful and express thanks to God for blessings. So let's just think about this just a minute. Did Jesus offer thanksgiving? Should we offer thanksgiving? Think about your day. What's one thing you're thankful for today? Running water. You got it. Hot water. Bathroom. <laughs> Inside. Food. Shelter. 
everything he created. I'm thankful I could come here tonight. We can come here and, and read the word and study the God's word without a guard being out that door because he just want to go out. The breath that we have. Thank you for your car still running. <laughs> now understand that. But he said he's as often so should we. But boy, we can get over the griping stage real quick, can't we? Right. <laughs> Not that you cry, Brandon. You have I want you to agree with me, yes. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting point. So if I woke up tomorrow and only had the things I was thankful for today. That's a good point, Brandon. I'm glad I called on you. Tomorrow we'll think about that. Just be mindful of that. But I think, again, because we're so since God has been here, so we have so much to be thankful for. We just take it so We take it so for granted. We do. We really do. Yes. Not the priest blessing. You're right. Oh, yes, definitely. You know, one of the things, learning to be thankful to him for who he is rather than the law for what it does. You know, that's one of the things, on the rules and regulations. But again, that we forget to be thankful on that. He became our great high. Because before you couldn't go to priest. Before you didn't have the Holy Spirit. You'd have to wait like the prophets do, oh, for the Spirit to come by. That is something to be thankful for. Don't have electricity. No water. Mm-hmm. No, we can't count. We have been so blessed. They don't have enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I said, take tea. They drink tea instead of having a meal a lot of times. We are so blessed, so blessed. We need to be so thankful, so thankful. And we should get up every day and be thankful. Thanksgiving is essential to prayer since that we, that we are, since that all we are and all that we have and all that we see, everything that I am, everything that I have, and all that I receive comes from God. The very air that I breathe comes from God. We need to be thankful for that. And the other thing we need to understand is we need to don't um, In Philippians 4 and 6, it's for nothing but everything but prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God. Again, Jesus offers thanks and so, so should we. But everything but prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving. Sometimes it's hard when I'm praying for something that I'm struggling with or my family members are struggling with. Like Diane and Harry with their son. It, it's very hard give thanksgiving for those types of things but anyway he said give thanks Psalms 106 verse 1 says praise the Lord oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy and dears forever Jesus modeled a model of thanksgiving and so should we However, we have a propensity to forget God's goodness goodness kind of like a leopard Jesus here ten, and how many came back one I wonder if I really go back to God and thank Him for things out of ten. When I breathe, drive my car, did I say thank you for gas? And 
leopard, so there was ten of them and only one returned. I wonder what my ratio is. And I know, I know it just sounds strange, but Lord, just thank you for the hot water. Thank you for those things that I have. Does that mean I ride a leaf at a day? Thank you for bread. Thank you for peanut butter. Thank you for jelly. That's not what I'm saying. But we could be much more living out a Thanksgiving lifestyle than we are. I think so. We can encourage it. So when I looked at this leopard, I thought, my ratio is probably not that good. <laughs> we have so much. Yes, we do. We are so blessed, so blessed on that. But again, Jesus lived a lifestyle of now, the next, the next thing we need to think about here is, and again, we're talking about why is it important that we spend time with God. Jesus prayed before making important decisions. In, Matthew, in Luke 6, verse 12 and 13, says, Now it came to pass in those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer, which we already talked about. He called his disciples, and then he chose 12. He also named apostles. You think he asked the Heavenly Father who to appoint? I think so. He and he needed the Heavenly Father to help him. How often the Father to help us make the I think probably more often than we seek him for decisions about making uh, uh, about making decisions. I wonder how many times we've made a dumb decision and realized that and we probably prayed about it when we made that decision. We've all been there, we've all done that. If it was Jesus to practice to pray before making important decisions, the more important the decision, the longer he In Luke 6, he says he prayed all night. Why? Why did he pray all night? He was going to the cross. He knew the opposition was great and was strong. Faith for him. He was God. He was man. You and I probably wouldn't have gone to the cross, I don't believe. But he wanted his father for guidance. And I think it is that he's an I think also he went and prayed for to make because it was like he said, an example for us. He's our and as man, he had to go and pray and spend time with God to make these important decisions. To stick to the decisions that had I think all of us would, would be the same way as him. But I also think sometimes we again will make decisions without any on there, and then look back sometimes. Well, why did I make that dumb decision? You can't hear anything. Sometimes we don't pray when we need it. Do what? No, we made that. <laughs> we made that decision without praying. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, like I said. Sometimes what we might think is teach us something sometimes if it well could be. Because <laughs> again, if we never went down into the junk dump, we wouldn't know that he could get us out of the dump. I mean, really, really. So why should we pray before a decision? Because prayer keeps us in tune with God's will and purpose. Jesus said to one on another occasion, before Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Basically, that was his desire on us. My desire is to please him to God. I wish I could tell you that I made, I prayed before everything, that I'm not on there. Um, I know that this Jesus gives us a sense to make some decisions on our own on there if we spent time in prayer. But major life decisions and things, you know, I don't ask God, what, do I have toast this morning or oatmeal this morning? You know, I don't think God expects me to ask him for those decisions. But life decisions. Do I change jobs? Do I do this? Do I move here? Do I move there? Do I do things? Again, you know, I've told y'all numerous times. Jesus said, Lord, if it's your will for us to move, then we need to uh, sell this house in a week. And a man came by with a cash offer. But we were trying to make a decision to move back or not to move back. Take your sign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
why, so twice we've had this, this situation. And so with our lives, I think it's sometimes if we'll just stop and say, okay, God, what is your plan? What's your will? Let me know how I need to make a decision. And Houston and I are praying about a decision that we have to make this week. You all just be in prayer for us that we make the right decision. Because... Basically, again, we are trying to make a decision that will affect us for the rest of our life, for the most part. And, you know, we're just wanting to know what God has, what he wants on there. And we're not leaving or anything like that. We're not, you know, we're just trying to decide if you need to retire in December or April. That's all we're trying to decide to do. <laughs> we're not going anywhere. We're not <laughs> and his boss wants to know. <laughs> so just be in prayer that... Um, you know, we have, we have this life decision to make. And it's important. It's important that we know what God's will is on here and that we do what he wants us to do. Because Houston and I kind of have a difference in opinion of some of the things that we want to do. So just pray for us that we make the right decision. But again, that's an important decision for us. So we have to make that decision. And we have to know by Monday, so y'all pray hard this week so that we have an answer by Monday. <laughs> and we'll be praying hard this week. But again... Um, this is the thing when we're making those important decisions. We need to pull time away and say, God, you know, we just need to hear from you. And I can tell you more than one time when I said, God, I need to hear from you. I wish I could tell you he spoke to me verbally, but most of the time he speaks to me through the word of God. He, I, I can remember when we were deciding to come up here, the final thing, we had to sell a business and move up here. I can remember the day plainly. I had said, God, we just need an answer. Houston had moved in April. I was still there in July trying to get things finished out. I said, God, we just need an answer. We need to end to this decision because we have something that kept going wishy-washy this way and that way. And um, I was reading my devotion, meeting the Word of God, and he says, um, you've skirted the mountain long enough, turn northward. Now, that probably didn't mean nothing to nobody else that day but me, but I knew exactly what that meant. It was time to go. And I think by the end of that week or something or other, we had resolved what needed to be resolved, and I was on my way up here. But I knew in my spirit when I read that, that was for me, and that was the answer. So most of the time when God has spoken to me, he speaks to me through the Word. And uh, I, he's never really spoke to me, I want to say verbally out loud. He speaks to my spirit, man, but most of the time he'll speak. If I need an answer, if I say, God, I really need an answer, I need to know about this, most of the time, it, he, it shows it to me in the scripture. Anybody else? The same way? Yeah. Same way. I think, is that confirmation, you think? Is that just because he knows we need the confirmation more than just... <laughs> I, I don't, I, I've never had anybody just come up and give me a word to answer my prayer. Have any of y'all? I mean, there, that can be done. God can give you a word from somebody else to answer prayer. But mainly mine has been through the word on here. On there. Um, the other part that prayer does keeps us in tune with God's will and God's purpose... Um, better. What's my time here? Yeah. Jesus said to, on another occasion in John 4, 34, my, again, my food is to do his will. We've talked there. He says, um, who did Jesus want to please? He wanted to cheat, please the Heavenly Father. So do we. I want my life to be what God wants it to be on them. So how do we apply these things? Praying and letting God, the Word of God lead us, let the Holy Spirit lead us. That's how we accomplish knowing what His will is and what His purpose is. He wants to keep us in tune with Him, and He has a purpose for every one of us. I look around at this room. I went to church with Rosie and Ricky 30-something years ago. You are the only ones, aren't you, in here right now? Pam one. Think about this. Marsha? Grenada, Mississippi, here. Y'all came from Jenny here. Winston Wimmel was not here when I was here first time. I was gone, and now I'm back. Brenda, Stephanie, y'all were sent here. I mean, you look about what God's purpose. Renee, you all, you come from where? Murfreesboro? Cleveland, Tennessee, where you? Okay. <laughs> Mecca. <laughs> but you understand, we're here. God's bringing it for a plan and a purpose. 
It, it just blows my mind to think that God takes me in Houston from Mississippi. He takes Rosie from, from here. He takes you from Cleveland. He takes y'all from Virginia. And we're all, and Martha from Mississippi, and we're here. Does it just blow your mind to think about that? Now, we used to go to church here. We used to go to church. What'd you say, Houston? Sorry. Born and raised, Mississippi. <laughs> right here in town. And you come right here. Yes. Is this the first your first experience with the Manchester Church of God, or have you been here before? Okay. All right. Okay. So again, we can go through life making all kinds of decisions. But what we want to really know is that God is alive in our life. And then we're, we're allowing him to help us make decisions in here. Um, again, if we're praying on important re uh, decisions, prayer reorients us towards what God is, what he's looking for. So what does God want from me? He just basically wants me to surrender my will, surrender, sur surrender to him, listen to him, and let him meet our needs on there. Um, so this is the confidence, again, 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we have asked of him. Basically, we can have this confidence if we pray, if we pray for a decision, we need to make a decision, we need him to supply our needs. We can have this confidence that is our Heavenly Father. He will meet our needs. He will meet our needs. Now, sometimes we want to give him it how we want it met. That doesn't work either a lot of times. That really does not work. But again, this is the confidence that we have. So we can look back at our lives, all, each of us can, and we can see probably some wrong decisions that we've made. Maybe because we didn't pray for God's will, or maybe we decided to do it our way anyway. We probably all, some of us have been guilty of that as well. But again, I think most of the time, if we'll just slow down before the Lord, he will give us the answers that we need. He will meet our needs. Again, most, most of the time I think we make decisions based on just what we see, just maybe the facts, and sometimes not even praying at all. But what does he say? Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. And that is what I hope we've learned, we're going to learn through this lesson, that we learn to pray continually. Um, again, we're going to continue on uh, next week about prayer because we will get to the point of uh, personal prayer and stuff. But I felt like if we could just understand that Jesus prayed and how Jesus prayed, I, I know most of us know it, but just to really look at it and to think about it, it helps and encourages me. I don't know about you, but it encourages me. Any thoughts for the close? Exactly. Um, I, I don't, they will know. What he said, they'll know us by our fruits. So we need to be fruit bearing Christians out in the world. Not rotten fruit, please. Good, fresh fruit. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are who you say you are and you can do what you say you can do, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come to the throne room of God and we can pray for you and that you hear and answer prayer. I ask that you'll go with us tonight, be with us, and bring us back in the next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.